Hello everybody, uh, my name is Noli Morimoto, just as introduced uh, I've been, uh, today. Right now I'm uh, managing the IB Major Pacific as a technical, uh, Chief Technical Officer. It's my great pleasure uh, to be here to meet all of you uh, at this uh, very special moment of the opening of this institution and the new school of uh, data scientists. And I'd like to spend a few minutes um, talking about you know, how IBM view this whole area as a data science uh, in general. And uh, it's not just about the data, it's about how we're going to address, how we're going to use all those data, and how everybody, this is relevant to all, right? It's not just the high-end, you know, corporate stuff. It actually touches everybody's life, everybody's moment. And if you have your cell phone in your pockets, you've already been part of the node emitting a lot of those personal data as a one of the IoT devices. I should not call it devices of people, but everybody is just emitting. If you have one of those light band that is measuring of your heartbeat and all that, right, you become one of the sensor generation elements uh, contributing to the data. If you are taking more than 10 pictures uploaded to Facebook, Instagram, is a contributor to the 2.5 million pictures every 10 minutes in the world. Right? So that's how everybody is involved. Evolved. Everybody is involved into those big data science areas. Before I enter and start my presentation, I'd just like to know a little bit about my history. You have been introduced that I've been in uh, MIT um, about 25 years, 20 years ago. And 1994 is the year that actually internet became available to the world. Right? Before that, there's a technology of the internet, but then 1994 is the year when it's just... Maybe you guys mostly are still in the school, or maybe even not born yet. <laughs> How many of you born in 1995 or before? Oh, okay, so quite a lot. Right. Yes, obviously. But that was the year, if you think about that, it's not that far many years ago, right? Not that far ago. At that time, you know, IBM actually started a project, Big Data, already. In IBM Silicon Valley, called Alma Den Research Lab, it's on the big hills in National Park. In the underground basement of that building, we have the large data center actually intend to collect all of the web data around the world. At that time, only two years after the internet became public, there's a 3.2 billion pages of web page being collected underneath that. At that time, it was a highly security secure project, and I'm not even allowed to talk about that. 20 years later, I think I can. Um, and that was the intention to analyze the, all the web data around the world and then to come up with the collective knowledge. And that's actually one of the evolution of the starting point of the, this AI, <coughs> big data scientists. 1995 is another time, is that the two years after the internet evolved, there are already people talk about the data explosion. We'll be flooded by the data, that more the data is coming in than we can handle. You know, the large of the amount of data coming in so that nobody can analyze. You know, 20 years later, guess how much data we're facing? It's actually a couple billion times more data. And every two years, according to the statistics, we generate more than data that whole human being has generated in the last whole history of human beings. And how scary is that? That is actually, if you learn in mathematics or statistics, that's more than so-called you know, um, <laughs> linear or non-linear or you know, uh, exponential, right? And how do we handle that? Of course, using computer. And how fast the computer can go, right? Every 18 months to two months, uh, 24 months, computer grows to X. That's more as well, right? And compared to that, the amount of data growth is much more larger, almost scary. So that's why there's a big gap of that necessity about the handling the data much more faster, much more smarter, right? and drastically advanced way to look at the data. That is what we really needed. And you can be so more excited than this to live in this moment, in this world, and you're about to learn or already experts doesn't matter. It's the most exciting moment for people who ever touch the data. 
and there has been no more, you know, I cannot stress more that how important this is. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, talking about that, you know, and playing great, this room, I guarantee this is 100% <laughs> get the job. There's no way that you, you know, if you leave it out after you, you learn all those things. Okay, so let me just take you through a few slides about uh, you know, the evolution of that, right? So we talk about this data, it's coming in. And I talk about the evolution of data, it's growing. Right now we're here. We already talked about that, you know, we're not be able to handle all the data we have. And this time is about now. And the data explosion I talked about 1995 is way beyond there. And this green part of the data is called structure of the data. That's how those data is fits into the columns, you know, rows, and then with the properly labeled structure. That is called structure data. That's the data we know. That's the data computer can handle today, right? So what are these all blue part of the data? It's called unstructured data. Unstructured data including speech, voice, image, you know, those kind of things. And which used to be, is very difficult to handle by computer. Of course you can collect it, you can show it, but analyzing, understand what does that mean, and compute and calculate it, takes a lot of you know, smartness. And that's why this evolution of artificial intelligence, or so-called cognitive computing areas come up. So that's a totally different way of handling the data compared to the structured data that we know how to crunch the number. And unstructured data, we need some additional new smart way of understanding data. And that's where we start evolution uh, I mean, it's on this whole cognitive computing areas. Oh, by the way, this here, 44 zettabytes is set 2020. It's not that far away, it's not four years, only four years. We get to the 20, 44 zettabytes. And Zettabytes um, is somewhere, you know, have a 21 zeros after 44. So, you know, difficult to handle, uh, as you can imagine. So this is what it is today, right? Because this is about, according to the status, about the 10% of data, only 10% of data is visible to computer. Right? Meaning that up among all the data we collect, there's only 10% that computer can analyze and try to make sense of it. It's almost equivalent to we only have a 10% slice of the picture. If you think that 10% is enough, or 10% is not enough, right? you look at that this way, so look at one piece of 10%. But if you look at the, the other different way of 10%, you may see that. So it's diff you have to know where to look for the data. You have to know right before you even analyze it. And this data window, by the way, if the data amount gets 10% more higher, which means that your window is getting 10% narrower, right? So imagine you have a smaller best, and best piece of the window. No matter you like it or not, right? This is not avoidable, unavoidable. If you even you say, I don't care about those data um, increasing, that's fine. However, the data Depends on, it doesn't matter that you like it or not, data is increasing so that, so that your window is getting narrower. And it might, by the time you under, analyze the whole picture, it may look like this, which might seem less. So we need a totally new way of understanding the data, which is what we call cognitive computing. Cognitive computing is not only crunching the number, you have to understand the problems, you know, come up with the reasons reasoning and continuously learning as the new data and new knowledge being refreshed. And also categorized with the artificial intelligence, but there's a different level of artificial intelligence. And one level is AI, it is talking about the fixed problems, which is like a you know, chess game we played you know, maybe 20 years ago, or like a Go game we played, or other board games kind of thing. This is human decided all the rules. And all the you know matrix is a limited spaces. Even is a large space like a 19 by 19 is a quite a big space for Go games, right? And however, there's only limited space, black and white dots. You're not allowed to pick, put the pink dots there in the Go game, right? You cannot put the dots in between the grades. You have to fix it. So that's a kind of uh, fixed problems. It has still has a millions of millions of the options to to need to be calculated and understand it, but it's a fixed one. So that's one class of AI. 
the other class of AI is analyzing the knowledge and come up with a Q&A, an appropriate answer to the question <coughs> answering the human. And that is what uh, Watson is doing. And I'll talk more about that in Watson. The third element of AI is the open domain speech or like a human-like interactions. You all know that the Siri, you know, when you talk to the phone, you know, answer that, right? That is a, but if you spend more than three minutes talking about that, you know, it might get bored. Because it's, a, after, after all, it will ask you, say, here's the web page, go find yourself, right? <laughs> That's a pretty much a limitation today. But even that, <laughs> it's very, very good compared to many years ago that we have uh, this very uh, primitive uh, things, right? So those are things all advanced. But it's still a long way to go between uh, now and we can you know, differentiate that from the human being and machines. And it is a, a way of expression called Turing test. Turing test is Alan Turing's when we invented the modern computer in the 1940s. And at that time, there already artificial intelligence concepts came up. No matter how it is, right, you can put the human idea of thinking into the mathematical representation. Machine can be thinking like human, right? So that's the original concept. And by the time if you put the human and machine behind the wall and you start to communicate with them with the text, if you cannot distinguish whether it's a human or machine, that means you pass the Turing test. Okay? 70 years later, still no one passed the Turing test. Um, right? It's a very tricky thing that you can ask, answer, ask, right? What's your name? If you won't go to um, what is your the movie like or something like that. Right? If you don't have an idea or concept or those are sentiments, those are the very very tough question to answer. So that's still today is a conceptual thing, right? Theory test. However, this is the third element is trying to pass that, which is very very uh, elegant um, stuff to, to deal with. But for the data scientist areas, what is really nice to focus is this middle middle part of the applications, which is a collection of a large amount of data and make sense of it and come up with the appropriate, useful answer to the practical questions. That's what this generation of AI is evolving. Okay. And uh, probably more shouldn't spend too much time talking about the AI, but like, like uh, just a few few steps of that just for your benefit uh, of understanding the history, is that uh, between the 40s and 90s, the modern computer is invented. Like I mentioned, it's already a concept of AI coming in, and computer or machine can think like human, if we can successfully put all those concepts and data into the mathematical, re mathematical representation. So that's the original concept. Then in the 80s, right, there's a new AI boom. Okay? So if you know that it's at the time it's a Lisp, it's a new language that came out, and then everybody learned the Lisp, creating the so-called expert systems that can answer the some of the very specific professional questions uh, for the human professionals. And another generation of AI boom came in around the 90s, and it's mainly around the so-called operational research. Right? It's already evolving the machine learning technologies and uh, data mining technologies that can associate and make sense of those things that are relevant together. Right? One uh, very, very typical example is the shopping cart uh, things. Right? They analyze all the host data and so figure out uh, the interesting combinations. There's a lot of uh, combinations that when people buy beer, they will buy some specific thing together. Does that anybody know about this story? Diaper. Yes. So that's a famous, uh, you know, things, right? When you, the father go to the shopping center, driving by car, right? and then you could buy, grab a meal, and then at the same time, the wife call you and say, hey, if you're in the shopping supermarket with your car, uh, please get some diaper. So the diaper and beer becomes a popular combination uh, after they analyze those uh, you know, data mining, right? But after that, this is a statistical analysis. So after this, everybody knows that then it becomes no interest, right? It's not interest, it's very static state, static, static state. And so after all, you know, people learn this operational research and all that, is that once the, the pattern is being fixed, <coughs> there's actually no, not much evolution, there's not much interest. So that's the you know, third generation of AI interest died down. Now we're in the fourth generation of AI, it's become more and more interesting. Because the data is dynamic, okay? So every day, the data will be refreshed. 
And this is the artificial intelligence, you know, starting analyzing using those data which are lively updated and come up with the answer. And this answer may change as the data changes, right? Because of, and also the machine and systems continuously learning. It's not programming, it's a learning. So that's the whole you know, difference about this new era of computing that we are facing. And why now? Right? Obviously, there's a lot of improvement of the analytics engine and those are machine learning skills and technologies, deep learning being evolved, right? And which probably you are learning or you are going to learn about many of those things. It is very, very uh, advanced technology. Some of them, including the graph theory, some of them, including the genetic algorithms improvements, right, to come up with the data analysis. So those are all the skills and tools that become, become more and more advanced. But it's not human being suddenly become smarter. There's a reason. The reason is data, or in other words, knowledge. And those kind of things, after internet evolved, and many of those data become digitized. And without the digitization of the data, a machine cannot take advantage of that. Right? And with those data, then you can improve the conversation engine. With those data, you can improve the dialogue interactions. With those data, you can improve the medical dynamic diagnosis and other stuff. Right? And not only data size is large, those are continuously refreshed. That's why this internet and all the you know, IoT data coming in as a flow, that makes this algorithm together smarter. Right? You cannot imagine that IBM have a Watson without data. Right? It's just an empty brain, very smart empty brain, but never study. What will happen? Right? <laughs> so that's a similarity. With those data, combination of the data and algorithms, that is really, really the essence of these days happening after the internet evolved, after all the IoT data collections, billions and zillions of data coming in. That's really important. But one more thing, elements that you tend to forget, it's about the computer power. You know, not just because I'm coming from IBM, right? It's a, it's a hardware is actually very, very important. You can imagine that if you have a thousand times more data, what would you do? You need a thousand times more computing power to compute it, right? Even many people think it's almost cheap, free, but even one cent, one um, cent, I should say that in the, in the one rupee <laughs> per kilobytes or something like that, right? If you have a billion of kilobytes, that's a billion already. It's not free. It's almost free, but not free. And think about that, have a 44, you know, 21 zeros after that. Right? And how much, how much money, if they are, India money, I cannot say. After denomination, I probably uh, report. Well, I just heard that uh, your uh, highest uh, bill has become obsolete. So maybe, um, right? Anyway, so those are numbers. Uh, you need still need computer hardware. And that's why the new area is coming. You know, compared to 20 years ago when we used a computer to play chess, they're actually more than 100 million times faster computer. And when it comes to the density of the storage, it's about the, close to the billion times dense uh, hardware, you know, uh, hard disk uh, memory storage, which means that the computer hardware allows us to tap and play with this much of the data much, much larger amount of data in a much, much faster way. That enables this whole thing to happen. So these three things has to come together, you know. So this is come together today. And that's why it's so special this time of year. And that's why I feel so fortunate to be involved in these science areas, especially the data science area in this field. This is probably once in 100 years kind of the industry revolution. <coughs> Uh, time that you guys are in, in this uh, areas of uh, analytics. And as we move into the future, you see that the zeta wise things coming in, right? So obviously we already see the limitation that current computing power or, you know, just a silicon switch, millions of those silicon switch computing data is not going to work. You know, it's obvious. So we start to invent the new things like brain computers, like quantum computers, as a new hardware so I've been continuously uh, invent, investing in those areas to cover that. Now, 
Now you understand this is a very special moment. It's not just a continuation with the past history of data scientists. It's actually three things come together at a very special time. That's why this age is very, very interesting. Okay, so let me skip some of the chart and just move into that. But before that, just one slide. I talked about a lot of things, but don't only remember these three things, please. One is that the algorithms and logical thinking, that element started, right? I mentioned about all the elements, eh? algorithms, I mean. Right brain is another small intuitive, uh, is uh, coming from the uh, artificial intelligence, new evolution, uh, machine learning, deep learning technologies. And those are consist of very smart brain. And then, but without the middle part, which is the knowledge, you know, these things is useless. So those things are come together that consist of three important elements. That's why this data science part is so important. Okay, so talking about the Watson, um, yeah, I'll talk about Watson and then I'll show you some of those real world examples. So anybody knows about the Watson projects? You know? Yeah, so, so it's a playing a Jeopardy show, right, in 2011. And I actually lucky enough to be in the New York Times lab uh, there when I was on assignment in the U.S. And uh, the meeting that I was is two, 10 years before that. Right? It's in 2006 when we started this project in York Heights. And I was there that day, the, the guy who leader of this project called David Ferrucci walked into the lab director's office and proposed this crazy idea about the plane game show. And at that time, the accurate rate ratio of those kind of game show uh, in the state of the world, art, is about 30% accuracy. So if you have 100 questions, you get 31, 30, 32 rights. And that's the state of art. MIT, Harvard, you know, uh, CMU, they all play with that, so that range. And David Furridge walked into the range and said, I have 42% accuracy. This is dramatic, you know. I, I should, we should go propose to play the game show. But everybody, all the other executive in the room says you're crazy. <laughs> Because the uh, game show champion like this, Brad and those uh, uh, Scott, these guys have a 92% accuracy. And especially this guy called Brad uh, in the room, right, has a special pictorial memory. So at the interview he says, I remember everything I read, everything I hear, everything I see in the picture. Oh, how, how tired that would be. <laughs> Imagine they have that kind of brain, it must be very tired. Anyway, so this guy is, is like that. So if he flipped all the baseball almanac or sports almanac and put it down, and any sports related question coming in, he can just immediately push the button and say, I know the answer. And then he can think about it after you hear the question and answer it you will almost get a 95 to 96 percent accurate. So that's the kind of person we're, we're facing to in the Jeopardy show. So what Watson does is not like human, right? So it's, still the, it's still the silicon uh, server with the Power 7, 2,800 cores, you know, with the several tens of the terabytes of memory spaces. Still the silicon, still server machine. But what Watson can do is understanding the natural languages what the question is being asked. And user reasoning part, second part, is a user reasoning to come up with the potential answers. Last piece is verify those potential answers with the back-end knowledge. At this time, it's, called, it's using a Wikipedia and several other literature databases being digitized. So, each of those potential answers be verified using those backend data and come up with a score called confidence levels. Okay? I oversimplify this. Actually, there's more than 50 steps step behind this. But if you remember just three steps, understand natural language where the question has been asked. The second piece is creating the hypothetical answers. Third is to evaluate them and come up to reorder the score. So that's what Watson does, right? And, but all this has to be completed within two seconds. Otherwise, one of these genius standing near, nearby would push the button answer with 92% accuracy, which there's no chance to win, right? So, two seconds or less. There's nothing that you can just search in the database, go on the web, there's no time for that. So that's how this system behind that is needed to be treated, okay? All right, anyway, so, you have to believe this, right? We successfully created this machine, this is the smart things coming up, and we beat the human being. 
That's the end of the story. And after that, you know, what kind of thing has become possible? Um, let's get this Right. So many other things become possible, and things like uh, analyzing the large amount of the social data, you know, trying to come up with the sentiments, probably one of the famous things that things are already doing this, you know, even before the cognitive, before the Watson. But this is not just pick the keywords, but understand the sentiment of the sentences. So if you say uh, the shoes or cosmetics red, or you say that your face is red, right? it's actually a different sentiment. Cosmetic red probably associated with positive. Face red probably associated with not so positive, right? Or if you say cry, if you cry in the sad story, that's a good story, right? If you cry in the business scene, that's probably not so good story. So you have to understand all the analyzing those, not only the keywords but also in the context, and that's really more complex than than you can think of. But including those the sentiment analysis or the groupings, technologies make it available to analyze the massive billions of incoming tweets or social media tweets or so, you know, natural languages to come up with sense making. Another useful example is analyzing incoming data of the uh, insurance claims. And this one actually already in place, uh, we work with the more than five major companies, in, insurance company in Japan, they're all using this, is to analyze the incoming uh, insurance claim. And some of those claims, including the mistake, some of, or error, some of there's an intentional uh, fraud uh, you know, claim. And so using the natural language, I'm saying, under, analyzing the forms and logistics and reasoning and to see that there's any um, you know, wrongness of the, so those incoming claims. And then we'll be able to separate those, uh, you know, definitely this is an appropriate claim, go to the payment immediately. That's about the 40% of those. The rest of the 60%, Half of them is that those are bullshit. Just send it back, ask for the re reward. In the middle part, only 30% human beings need to go analyze. So this actually saves the dramatic time of the claim payment and insurance payment cycles. And that's what really adopted today, you know, from all those major insurance companies. Call center incoming call analysis is another one. Very famous one, right? It's not just a drop in into the uh, frequently asked question, but it will machine will l listen into the customer's conversation between the uh, call takers and the customers, and understand the context and understand what the customers needed, and pop up all those uh, potential answers or hint on the screen for the call operators, so the operator can appropriately address to those questions uh, in the right information without the searching, you know, hold on a second, search and, or ask the supervisors, or I need to transfer your call to some other supervisors. And without doing that, this will improve efficiency more than 15%, and in many cases, actually drastically reduce the workforce of the call centers. And that's actually been another uh, very, very uh, popular application. And of course, when you talk about the big data, it's analyzing a lot of incoming sensor data. And the big machine, like a tanker, they have a more than 20,000 sensors on the ship. And the engine in the ship is a large, like a, you know, in, in gymnastics. It's actually big, much bigger than this room, with all kinds of pipes and sensors and coming wire, right? It's a diesel engine. And imagine that one of these components fail in the ocean after the ship is gone out. Whoops, they have to stay there for, you know, how long? Replace the parts. And by the way, this larger kind of tanker, there's only six engineers, uh, usually in average, on board. So it's very, very difficult if you do not. So the predictive maintenance is very important. It's not just detecting the failure, it's do the predictive maintenance. These components need to be replaced, you know, otherwise it will fail <coughs> three weeks from now. Or if you're on board, this, you have to slow down the ship and to make these components last longer and otherwise you will need to break them, right? that kind of thing. So it's not just predicting the failure, you will give the appropriate advice to the ship owner, to the operators to do that. So this has also come from the very complex you know, machine learning skills, uh, you know, the stochastic processes to do that, but it's become very, very useful applications. And another thing is much more shorter period is the you know, racing car. We also work with the McLaren and Honda 
you know, to analyze in very, very high speed and re near real time analysis uh, for the, uh, the, 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 the Formula One race. And this one, you know, recently, those uh, Formula One race engine has become hybrid. So there's a recovering of those energy and electricity from the heat of the engine. And or when you push the brake, there's also generated heat. You can recover those heat to use that as an energy to feed back and to the engine. So that's how the Formula One is working these days. Now, as a driver, you say, if I can save my oil using my heat generated power to run one more round, I can save one more round of heat in. Right? So this is, you know, very big trade-off. So it's, it's no more that human can run it only by their own intuition. They all needed those machines and computer support and things that the people. So there's a couple hundred people actually surrounded this machine. You know, Alan and they go there and are providing the you know advice and input to the drivers through the microphones, and that's how the right race gets run. So even though Formula One is not is run by uh, artificial intelligence, no. and of course, if you can provide advice to the large tanker, you can provide advice to human being. And we also work with the, some of the rugby team and they put the best on the players and to analyze more than 140 elements of the human being. If you don't know even, I have 140 elements of my bio data, other than the pulse and my temperatures. There's a lot of things you can analyze. And not a predictive maintenance, but predicting the, the uh, risk for the injury. And to advise, you, know, you need to take rest, or you need to uh, build a more stronger muscle here and there, or you need to, you know, do some other exercise or stuff like that. Right? So those kind of things are uh, healthcare areas as well. And healthcare in other uh, areas like the diabetes, or regular people's healthcare, or analyzing the human uh, social presence or behaviors. You know, and this one is for elderly, especially in Japan. There's a big issues about elderly, senior, and aging populations. And how do you better engage with those elder? And we, by analyzing a lot of data. One of the typical analysis of data is that we give them iPad. And it's actually pretty good even for the senior people to play with iPad. I actually get the iPad to my, my father and then he's there playing very well. Um, but things here is that you not only collecting the data but also collecting the speed of scratching the iPad surface. Right? So you might do this things you know, like this, but one morning maybe you do tremble like this. Oops, there may be some issues, and maybe some problem happen, right? So then you generate some kind of behavior analysis on how fast you scratch the surface, the trembles, or, yeah. and if you repeatedly making the same mistake or errors, that might be the indication or sign of some other dangerous uh, symptoms, right? And then give you the warning. Yeah. And that also comes with the big data analysis of those uh, scratch uh, surface movement. Of course, in medical that and diagnostic area become very, very famous. And there's a new, more than 300,000 articles or more than 3,000 new articles every day coming up. There's no uh, physicians or doctors can read all those uh, information, providing the accurate you know, update for that. Right? You never know that there's a new paper coming and indicating dangerous side effect of some particular drugs that you should not use for the specific patient like that. And with this, new AI systems, right? You'll be able to continuously refresh your backend data and you generate the, the hypothetics and you refer to those uh, latest data generated in the world and to be able to use into the uh, useful uh, daily reactions when you need it. Medical diagnostics, you know, genomic analysis and even analyzing the genomics um, of those uh, copy beans. Right, I said to help build a better um, you know, genetic characteristics. And we also have uh, another excellent for the food and uh, food truck. You know, analyzing the, uh, the new components of the ingredients of the food and then to come up with the ideas for the new um, you know, uh, dishes for the sense. Right. And right now we also build uh, in Washington DC about another project is running the uh, you know, unmanned car. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, totally autonomous vehicles, but also have uh, AI inside. And then to um, be able to answer and interact with the human and then the organization, we can just get on, hop in on, on one of those cars, say, please, please go to somewhere, you know, and then, or um, tell me the, where's the, you know, great uh, Italian restaurant around. And, and then that will react 
and talk to you back and then make a reservation for you and come pick me up at a particular location 7 p.m. something like that right so that's a that's an experiment thing but it's already running in the part of the city in the Washington DC if you happen to be there you may want to drop us. Alright so those are I don't know how much that's a lot of time. <laughs> so maybe just the last one, right? So I talk a lot about the computer science data generates, and uh, this is still evolving. And as we are, you know, we need to have a lot of the advanced technologies, including the data scientists that you're learning, but also the new technologies uh, I mentioned about the quantum computing, the other analysis computing. But that's the scientific computer science part of approach. The other part of approach is that to study about the human brain. So. What ultimately we're trying to do is to build a similar system like a smart human, right? That's what people do. And in your whole life until now, you, know, you don't know how many literature you, you read, how many uh, TV program or YouTube video you watch, right? That's the collective knowledge that's stored in your brain. And then you answer the question, to the question, okay? you know, with your idea, right? And you thought it's your idea, but it's actually a collection of many things that input to your brain. So, how do we build a similar thing like that? How do we build a, if we can build a pictorial memory guy, brain? Easy machine. Does that be wonderful, right? So, imagine that uh, people, with the Jeopardy machine that we build with the silicon and, you know, memories, that takes about the 200 kilowatts power to play. 200 kilowatts. And uh, you have any idea that how how much power that your brain consume? Any idea? Is that uh, more than the light bulb or less? Huh? Less? Yeah, so if the light bulb is 60, 60 watts, let's say, 60 watts, light bulb. Is your brain is the consumer more than that or less than that? <laughs> less. Yes. Human brain is about uh, 18 watts in average. So it said 20 watts, right? So 20 watts versus 200 kilowatts, right? So that's the amount, you know. So it's about the, uh, you know, tens of thousands of uh, more power consumed. Now, if you, if we can successfully build the mechanically similar to human brain, would that be bad? So this is the idea we came up brain build a chip called True Noise, and this one has about the one million neurons inside and built in silicon. So it's not exactly like human brain, but it's part of simulating that. And the big difference of this chip to the conventional computer CPU is that the cycle time. So regular chip that you run by 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz, that gigahertz means that you need to continuously take the clock in 3 gigahertz, even the CPU is doing nothing. This one, similar like brain, your brain doesn't have a 3 gigahertz or anything, right? <laughs> Taking your brain, right? If you do, just tell me, <laughs> I need to measure. So we don't have that. All we do is that when there's some stimulation coming, you spark. When the stimulation coming, you spark. It's just a continuous of those that stimulate, stimulate spark, stimulate spark. That's what human brain does. That's why it's so low power, right? We don't need to operate all the time with a couple of those clocks. And that's what this uh, chip is being inspired. So with the one, neuro, one million neurons uh, equivalent to this one of these yellow chips in here, it, costs, it takes about one thousandth less power than the conventional computer chips. Okay? So this all together about 16 million neurons on this board. Right? It's, but it's still it about um, you know, tens, of, tens, of, uh, it's, uh, yes, tens of thousands less than human brain. Okay? So it's equivalent about the bee, bumblebee, the brain. It's so insignificant, right? You can just hit it and back. It's so insignificant. But take a little bit, I think, about the human, the bee's brain. Bee has five eyes. It has two compound eyes and then three single eyes, emitting, sensing the light strengths. And those the eyes can actually sense the images and so on, right? And there's also scientific study saying that B can recognize human face. So if you mess up with their net, you know, <laughs> beehive, and come back the next day, they'll know, ah, that's the guy. Yeah. 
So that's a, a totally the scientific study. So if they can do re image recognition, good enough to recognize human face, or is that a bear coming or you know monkey coming, right? That kind of things. So they can recognize. That's one thing. And, and how much power, computing power that takes? That's one. Second is that they can recognize the, the you know directions by detecting the sunlight, where the sun is, you know, what time of the day. They don't have, they don't carry Apple Watch or anything like that. Right? And they, they, they take that. And they know exactly where they are. And, it, and two kilometers away from their nest, finding the flower, they'll be able to come back exactly where the spot there. Not only that, they can do some kind of a funny dancing and then to tell their fellow bees where the flower is. And next bees, looking at that dance, they can find the flower exactly where they need it. Is. Right? That's another thing. They can, of course, maneuver, right? If you're trying to catch it by hands, you know, human too soft. They fly most elegantly than any of the drone existing today, right? Do you agree? And last but not least, they build a perfect hexagon house, right? With the identical lengths. Never mistake, right? Plus minus 0.1 you know, percent of error, right? And uh, with perfect collaborations. And they do all this, you know, few hours after they hatch from the, the, the what they call, that egg, I guess. Um, right? After they, they hatch, right, they, they, they fly. And they have no time to go to school like you. <laughs> right? And all the things, all come in into this one, less than one million euro. So, there's a lot of potentials with this things, right? Even with the fraction of the things that we start to build, um, there are many, many things we can do. Imagine all of one of these devices being built into the sensors that is spread across more than billions of times in the world, right? And all each sensor become much smarter, right? And, and so on, right? Anyway, so even with this, you know, the smarter gets more, uh, sensor gets more uh, pervasive, each sensor gets smarter, and there's aggregated data still coming in, and so on, right? So the last word I'd like to uh, tell you uh, on this group is that, uh, you know, don't just do the number crunching. You have to do understand why we're doing this, and what is this for, right? And the business impact, and then the effect, and then your user of the data, how they're gonna use those data, right? As a future data scientist, that's actually the most important thing on top of what all the, you, the mathematical equations or the techniques you do. It's nothing more than important than that idea. Because many of those activities or calculations will be replaced by machine. Will be. But the idea of what to look for, how we look for, how it's going to be used in the industrial context is going to be very, very important. And that's why you're so uh, fortunate to be in this institution that's not only teaching the technique for the you know, crunching number, but also the real world problems, and then how they're gonna use it in the context of the human's life improvement. Okay? So that's really uh, the great opportunity here. And um, lastly, just uh, thank you for your attention, and it's my great pleasure uh, to be here, and good luck to all of your futures. Thank you. Thank you.